Hello and welcome to this week's review on My Hero Academia. This week I'm reviewing the episode, Those Who Defend, Those Who Violate. Just two quick things before we get into the review itself. Number one, in the middle of a heat wave, got the window open, got my rattly fan on. See if you hear any weird noises, that's where that is coming from. And number two is I've been sick this week, I've been ill this week. So if I sound a little bit off and out of kilter and this isn't quite to my usual high energy standards, you know why. But with that said, let us get into the review itself and start off this review as we always do with these reviews by talking about the positives. All the things I like about this particular episode I have to say that this is some of the best animation pound for pound in this animation thus far this series it has some great twists and clarifications and it had some really interesting will building I think it's best to talk about the animation first and foremost because this is the kind of stuff that is a little bit more visceral and easy to digest and I have to say is that Without sounding like I'm getting into the negatives very prematurely, I have to say is that this season the animation has felt a little bit inconsistent for my liking. Yeah, this standard this year has been great, but I think that previous seasons have been a lot more consistent, where it felt as though we're on a similar kind of standard to everything. This year, this animation has ranged from good to fantastic, whereas in this episode, it was more or less of all the same high standards, which was really great for me. It made the entire experience a lot more easy to sit through, because, let's be face it, you don't have quite the same level of hard snaps as you go from this fantastically, brilliantly animated action sequence to just something that looks a little bit more conventional and typical of television animation. I think that this is a great episode pound for pound. I think the animation of it is one of the things that really helps elevate it to the next level and take it a level beyond plus ultra. It really helped to make it a more impactful episode, not just in terms of the action, but also in terms of the emotional weight of many of the things our cast of characters are going through. Yes, there's a few things here and there that I wish we've done better, but those are things I'll discuss as we go deeper into the view itself. I think that pretty much every single scene and every single sequence that we've got within this episode, whether it is action related or something that's a lot more character driven, was good. I I will admit that I think that the slight blind spot for me within the episode was the sequence of events with All for One, which in isolation looks good, but compared to certainly some of the action sequence stuff that we also get in this episode, it feels a little bit disappointing, where you go from this really fluid, great, impactful, really physical, physical, weighty animation, these great fight sequences then just get off one blipping around the fight area like he's some character at a Dragon Ball or something, just a typical anime character, which I get, I understand, because, you know, He's a powerful dude, especially now, but, you know, kind of doesn't quite have the same stand there for me. But still, I think that the animation within the episode is great, and it does feel as though... It really does help create the feeling that our cast of characters are really throwing everything that they've got left in them into what's happening here. They're throwing everything they've got left in the tank to try and deal with whatever problems are in front of them. I think that the transformation sequence that we get with Tomura when we get that later on in the episode is fantastic as well. It leans into just this insanity, this broken mental state that he has. He cannot comprehend people trying to fix what is broken. He can't comprehend how that would be the case because as he mentions within the episode itself no one reached out to him no one reached out to him to try and help him to try and fix him and as we see many times with the character when he gets into this wound up mental state the hands come out or in this case it's literally hands coming out of him to form this body armor and for the other side of his body to start resembling his lost loved ones which I want, to, I want to see that animation. I want to see that taken to the next level. I just want to see how weird and creepy and almost Frank Henelot of this shit can get. But hey, we'll soon see about all that as we go forward with it. We, we might as well talk about it in the here and now because I don't have much to say about it. But having All For One go from All For Jerky back to All For One Classic Edition, I think is good. I will... Good, relatively speaking. I mean, I'd have been perfectly fine if he for the rest of this series as this all for jerky monster guy or at the least we got into the all for one classic edition a little bit later on but that might be something I discuss when we get into the season long review but we'll get there when we get there I did like the fact that we got the clarification as to actually what was happening with him at first initially I thought that the reason why he was 
starting to heal was simply because so much damage has been done to him that he actually could heal properly now. He'd overhealed at some point in the past, which made him look like the, the thumb in the suit that he was before. And now, oh, thanks, you, you've you hurt me so much that I can be better now than I was before. And he makes some kind of speech about how oh, wildfires in Redwood Forest help new shoots grow or something like that. We didn't get that, and that's fine. I have to say is that see, <laughs> having him healed and back to his prime self feels oddly relevant to this channel, bearing in mind that last week I did my review of All Might Rising where I talked about, oh hey, wouldn't it be freaky, creepy and spooky if he was ever at his full power and then it happened this week. That's purely out of happenstance. I didn't plan that. That just happened by a freak coincidence. It's just a bit of serendipity that we can just enjoy in the here and now. I will admit, like I mentioned, the, the thing of him flicking about the battlefield in the way he does do, I'm a little bit mixed on it. On the one hand, it does feel like anime bullshit territory for me, which I'm not really an anime person, which is kind of ironic. Bear in mind that I've done like 200 videos on this series alone, both in anime and the manga form. But still, I'm not entirely clean on that. But at the same time, it is a great way to demonstrate the amount of power that he has to just show how skilled and powerful that he is. He's already beginning to steal more quirks. I mean, why he needs more quirks, I don't know. But to be fair, he has given a bunch of them away. And a bunch of them have been destroyed. So at this point, it's just a case of window shopping and getting whatever he can get. I think the more significant aspect of that scene is that we get more of an insight as to why he became the villain that he is. And it's because of comic books. Because, and I don't remember the exact wording of it, so forgive me. Because the villain is the entity that no matter where you are in the world, no matter what culture you are from, not whatever part of the world you're brought up in, the villain is always the villain. They are always this creature, this entity, this person that you hate and that you fear. And it's a universal hatred and fear. It doesn't matter what, where, again, what part of the world you grew up in, what culture that you grew up in. Dr. Octopus is still Dr. Octopus. The Red Skeleton is still the Red Skeleton. I know that's not his name, but whatever, you get the idea. And that's an interesting idea. And the whole idea that superhero culture in comic books and media would go on to inspire heroes and villains in this world, in a world where superpowers and super abilities become real, is a fascinating one for me because... Let's face it, it's what would probably happen in real life. Like, if quirks were real, like quirks emerged like 40 or 50 years ago, you'd know that by now you'd be getting tons of people diving about pretending that they're the real Joker baby. You'd just be getting that. Like, if it turned out that quirks existed tomorrow, you'd get a bunch of people, some of which pretended to be Superman or All Ford or whomever. That's that's basically just how it would end up going. And I like the fact that it's something they're leaning into a little bit here. We will probably get a greater insight into his backstory as we go forward forward with this that's an inevitability regardless of anything else the idea of the quirk destroying bullet is being used is a modified version of Ari's quirk is interesting i will admit there was a part of me that was worried that it they'd turn around and say oh no now he has her quirk which yeah that really would be going into anime bullshit territory in a way that i wouldn't have been comfortable with and of course, we did get another Quirk Doomsday reference from Dr. War Crimes, which if you know how I feel about the whole Quirk Doomsday thing is... Yeah, I mean, it makes sense with the character beyond anything else. You, I can always headcanon it to unreliable narrator-esque things, but at this point, from my point of view, Dr. War Crimes feels like the kind of person that if the ice cream fell off his corner, he'd be lame the Quirk Doomsday. <laughs> Anyway, moving on to something a little more serious and something I won't dwell on to too much. I did enjoy the scene where we got the generic, nondescript president of the United States suggesting that maybe they should surrender to Tomura. I liked that scene. I mean, let's be honest, in the grand scheme of things, it wouldn't bloody work because I feel that they're underestimating what Tomura is, an, is after. He's not all for one. He doesn't want this controlled chaos and anarchy. He doesn't want to be the demon prince, as all for one seems to often talk himself as well, the demon lord, as he often says that he is. No, Tomura wants destruction. He wants to blow stuff up and tear everything down. He wants sheer destruction. You can't really negotiate with a hurricane, which is effectively what he is at this point. Though, with that said, I also think that this generic president is also underestimating the American populace. 
Like, wasn't it a, a Japanese admiral or general that said that the problem with invading America was the fact that you'd have a, a rifle behind every blade of grass? <laughs> Imagine that kind of thing, but everyone's got a quirk, and they're not best pleased at the fact that this weird, <laughs> scratchy little nobody's trying to take over the country. Like, it'd be anarchy, it'd be chaos, there'd be a lot of death and destruction, but I don't think it's going to be a case of everyone going, ah, well, you know... <laughs> That's just the way things are. I mean, yeah, you don't blame me. I voted for the other guy. But I do the thing in seriousness, though. I do like the sheer desperation that we do get in that scene. It's the case of that they've tried the superhero solution. They've tried the technological solution. And the only thing that they really have at this moment to try and save the country, to and save as many lives as possible, is to try and negotiate and come up with some kind of scheme to work with this guy. And I... I like that. I wish we'd saw a little bit more of the international response to all of this, bar the little flicks on TV screens that we've seen here and there in meetings, which honestly feels like it's more of a case of an Easter egg for the International Hero Mission movie from last year. Because I think that given the whole scale of all of this, it would have been interesting to see, to just see... Because we had had it hinted that All For One has influence all across the world, so it would be interesting to see exactly where all that is going, beyond just having... Uh, stereotypical French villains versus stereotypical French heroes, which at no point we're going to uh, flash to at some point or another. Like, it would be interesting to see exactly what the response is internationally about this. How do other nations see this? Do they see it as a threat or do they not really care? Are they more concerned about what's happening in their country domestically? Do they see the link between All For One and what's going on there? Are there some political leaders who are in league with All For One or the Metal Liberation Army? You know, maybe you've got a situation where we get a flick to whatever country, I don't know, Germany or whatever, and the Chancellor's thinking, oh no, we're going to have to break out to the, the Super League of Heroes to deal with all this, but then you get some, you know, adversarial politician, the leader of opposition saying, ma, the Chancellor's off their heads, we need a new leader and it will be me and I will lead this country to victory, and really they're in league with all for once, well, that would be neat, we're not probably not going to get that, but that kind of stuff, I think, would add to help build out the world a lot more, because I like the world building stuff in this series, but whatever... Can't criticise stuff that isn't there, so I'll move on. The idea that Meta Liberation Army or Skeptic is building up to something is interesting. I will admit, I'm not entirely sure exactly what he's doing because it was an info dump at a time I wasn't paying much attention because A, Feel Good Inc., technically our second musical reference of the episode, the first one being that Bakugo was shot by the heart and you're to blame, you give love a bad name, and B, because Dabby is up and about again. I will admit that first of all, when we saw Dabby up and about, I thought it was a flashback that was all of a sudden going to get a cut to Shoto doing something before maybe Dabby woke up, but no, it was live, so to speak, happening in the there and then, and boy, that was a really bad... <laughs> bungled reveal. Like, I, I was imagining this way, because it was obvious that uh, Dabby was going to get up and about again, and they were going to have the second round of them two fighting. But I was expecting more of a build into it, not just a, oh, by the way, he's back. Like, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a disappointment, but we'll see exactly where they end up rolling with all of this. Maybe there will be a little bit of a flashback in an episode or two's time to just show him stirring and waking up i really hope that there is because yeah it feels as though we've skipped a bunch of episodes to get to this point like this feels like this should be like one of the final three episodes of this season when we've got another nine or so left anyway let us pivot into the main big desperate battle at the flying coffin thing which I will admit it's hard to talk about in great detail because it's one of those cases where so much is happening yet so little is happening at the same time. This is almost entirely focused on the action sequence between our heroes and our villain. It is this big painful grind as our heroes find themselves getting into increasingly desperate cha extents to try and deal with Tomura and with the critically injured Bakugo. Bits of people are being ripped off, blood is flying over the place, everyone's throwing in whatever they can to keep the fires of hope burning for as long as possible, though I do wish that it was paced better and that this was, again, maybe someone that took over the place of three episodes or so, that maybe this was the end result of maybe three episodes of grind, but still, most of what ends up happening here, the meat of what happens here, is the emotional and the psychological. As I mentioned previously, we have the stuff with 
uh, Tomura's fragile and fraying mental state, the confident villain that he was at towards the start of this fight has pretty much broken down now to almost exactly where he's always ended up being, which I think is interesting. So maybe people may see that as a regression of his character development, but I think it's actually interesting and actually way more interesting than a lot of people may end up giving it credit for. But we have our heroes being worn down and broken down mentally and physically, again, trying to throw in what they can to try and keep this whole thing going long enough so that maybe Midoriya can get there in time, which he ultimately ends up doing. We get the scene of the ninja hero guy sacrificing himself. A neat idea. I think that it would have been far more impactful had he been more of a recurring figure, had we seen him a lot more throughout this series up until this point. It would have been a lot more tragic, but it is that weird thing that we see in anime where we get a character we don't really know much of that's just been in the background, then they have what feels like the major sacrifice moment that a major figure within the series should end up having, and then we get all their backstory in the face of about two and a half minutes, which just seems to be the weight of these things. But anyway, good for what it is, interesting for what it is, I'll be interested to see where it's actually going with it in the future. We then have what is probably the more meaty part of the emotional adventure here, which is the stuff with Lamillion having to become the hero that Sir Knight I saw him as. And that ends up developing in a gag, which I think worked perfectly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's kind of meant as a gag, but... I think that it really just ends up working to further show the sheer desperation that he had in that moment. That the only thing that he has to try and buy time and to try and create something of a distraction, even just for a few more seconds, is just to do the peach gag thing. And yes, it's crude and it's silly and it's kind of out of place, but... It is the fact that he's so out of place and he's such this emotional juxtaposition which makes it so impactful. He has nothing left. He doesn't have the strength to do this. He doesn't have the backup to do this. The only thing that he has left is to just pull a gag and to pull a joke and to do something like that. And I really do like that bit. It is just throwing everything at this problem in the hope that it works. And... It worked because Midoriya is now here now. We're now starting to get into that fight, which feels like, again, something that's happening maybe three or four episodes too soon. We have a slightly negative tone in the air. Let us move into the negatives. And first of all, I have to say is that my major negative is that this episode felt rather overstuffed and over congested. You had three major scenes happening within this episode, or rather sequences of events that are very pertinent to the action they're in. We had, of course, the stuff with Tober and the heroes. We had the stuff with All for One. And then we had the stuff with Dabby coming back to life. These all should have been things that had a lot more time and a focus within themselves. Stuff that maybe you split up between that and something else. But you have three major reveals. Three major moments in this episode. And they're taking option from one another in a way that I don't like. You could quite easily have had an episode which is just focused on... Uh, Dabby coming back to life or coming back into action or for one coming back into action everything we had in this episode with the heroes having their desperate last stand against Tomer could have been its own episode I think that the, at least the stuff with Tomer could have been two episodes at the very least maybe three if we really drag it out a little bit more but it is it is the way that it is I think that the pacing of this kind of section of the story is what feels the most baffling to me as i mentioned in the past but we'll move on and we'll probably end up talking about that when we get into the series long review and that the other issue that i have is somewhat tangentially related which is the stuff with bakugo's heart which couldn't that have been left for another couple of weeks at least like it genuinely feels like but the last episode that we had was the, oh no, he's been shot through the heart and you're to blame. Now this week, oh, we're going to try and fix him now. I mean, sure, next week he's not exactly going to be up on his feet saving the day, nor the week after that. But all the same, it feels as though we're getting into the, the desperate last sacrifice to save his life a little bit too bloody quickly. It feels like it should have been left an extra couple of weeks, but... We'll see. I think the big problem with this episode, like, to just boil it down, is there's too much happening and the pacing of some of those events just feels a little bit too narrow, particularly in the grander scheme of this series as a whole, or this season as a whole, I should say. With that said, let's get into the overview, and I think that this is a great, if overpacked, episode. I mean, there is a lot in this episode, which could have been a whole episode in and of itself, as I've just mentioned, but... 
it now really does feel like we're getting into the home stretch, even though we are only nine episodes away from the end of this season. And it is looking, as certain commentators on this channel have mentioned in the past, that the next season, next year, might be a bloody short one, given how very little it seems as though we've got left to do without dragging this out to extremists. But still, with that said, let us get on to what you find and what you thought about the previous couple episodes with Comment Corner! It's time for Comment Corner. This episode's taking longer than I thought it would, but I'm ill. Hey! Anyway, time for Comment Corner. Reading our comments from previous reviews and previous videos I've done on this subject matter. We talk this week from two videos worth of comments. First of all comes from Big X1 from the, the a previous episode of My Hero Academia where they talk about... I didn't see this one coming, now I feel shook. This of course being referenced to back ago getting shot through the heart and you're to blame, you give love a bad name. Yes, I keep making reference to that song, but I like it. But still, you get the idea. And I just wish that I felt similar to where Big X1 felt. But again, this is one of those situations where it was sport for me well, well in advance. We end up moving on now to Scott TV Game and comment on the same video saying as I'm a big fan of how this episode was handled. I wasn't expecting to be as good as it was. I'll definitely have more to say for the next episode, mainly about a certain aspect of it which bound to be very controversial. Although I have a feeling it's one of the things you've been spoiled on. I don't know exactly what they're referring to in this episode, which is the thing about All for One being uh, re revived, that's not something that I knew about. The thing about Bakugo's heart, well, we knew about Bakugo's heart being blown out, so that's not really much a controversial thing. But it'd be interesting to see what they thought the controversial thing was for me. And I have to say, is I am happy that they have been enjoying how all this has been washing out for them and how this has been going for them because they are a fan of the manga so i'm just happy for it i'm happy for anyone that's being happy right now the weather's starting to get to me i'm starting to get a little bit delirious so we'll move on to our final comment and this comes from real town newer i'm not going to read out the whole thing but they mostly talk about how this weekend either today or tomorrow is going to be the final chapter of the my hero academia manga and there's going to be a statement from the series creator as well as some of the staff from studio bones who are in charge of doing the anime and there's going to be leaving some comments about the future of the series going forward and exactly what is actually going to... Well, maybe not exact specifics, but we'll end up seeing with all of it and how the series is being handed over to someone else for the time being. I know that there was an interview with uh, the series' creator a couple of weeks back where... They were asked about if they would ever do a sequel series to My Hero Academia and they made the joke about, Oh yeah, I've already started planning it and it's going to have aliens in it. <laughs> and the interviewer thought they were being serious for the whole of a minute before they would turn down and say, No, no, I, I, I'm joking. I'm really just joking. So, without getting into speculation as to what's going to be going on for forward, I think it's been a case of that... I don't think we're going to get My Hero Academia Year 2 or Season or Series 2 or whatever... Anytime soon, I think that's not going to come for another two or three years. If not, nah, I think that what we're probably going to end up getting is spin-off stuff being wrapped up. Maybe some spin-off stuff to fill some gaps here and there in the timeline and some movies. In the meantime, I think the series itself is going to be put into a little bit of a suspended state. There's still going to be stuff coming out for it. It's still a new series and stuff. I don't know. I've not had a chance to really consider this. Put it, taking, taking off my fan hat and putting on my producer hat for a second, but... We'll see about that. I'm sorry I'm getting a little bit delirious, of course. And apparently, as they mentioned in a follow-up comment to this, is that on the 5th of August, there's supposed to be some kind of big news to do with the series. What that will be, we don't particularly know at this point. I have no idea what it could end up being. But as I have learnt to my shock and horror when it's come to looking and covering anything to do with anime and manga, these big reveals really are everything and nothing. It's either going to turn out to be some big epic new thing that's going to make us go, Oh wow, that's amazing! Or it's going to be, oh no, it's just a mobile phone game. Or, oh no, it's just you merchandise. Which the people in the preview video are going to talk about like it's the biggest, most important thing in the world world but we'll soon see i mean on the fifth it's when the movie in japan comes out i thought it was coming out the fifth internationally it's not it's not coming out until my birthday internationally i don't even think it's coming out in the uk i don't know yet we'll soon see about but anyway thank you all for watching sorry this one's been a little bit long and waffly but i'm still feeling a bit 
ill and it's hot weather. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching and see you next time. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, favourite, subscribe, click the bell and do all the YouTubey stuff that YouTube wants you to do. Go on, it'll do me a power of good. Until next time, my friends, goodbye.